Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for another opportunity to feast upon your word together. I thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done in our lives, all that you're now doing and all that you will do. I ask that you would open our minds to understand the truth of your word as only you understand it. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish, uh, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and my face is a little messed up because I decided that I was going to uh, do some uh, winching with a, uh, a ratchet, uh, a cable, a cable and a chain, uh, doing some work on uh, our little barn, and uh, the cable snapped. Well, the cable didn't snap, but the hook came loose, and it and it hit me in the eye, and so uh, I'm pretty I'm fairly certain that it it knocked some of the nonsense out of me. So we're going to begin our study in the uh, epistle to the Philippians. Uh, if you're new to this channel, I invite you to study along with us. I took a short. Uh, little a brief interlude between Revelation and now at the suggestion of several of uh, our longtime viewers uh, who I, I, I think they they thought that I needed a break and I probably did uh, so uh, I gave you about a week to uh, uh, catch up you know on uh, our study in Revelation to wrap that up, complete that up on your end before we started in Philippians, which is an entirely uh, different theme altogether. I just want to thank you all for all of your continued comments and your words of your kind words of encouragement. I want you to know that during the time that I took off, uh, about a week, uh, eight, nine days, uh, perhaps, that it I missed you all, uh, and I, I think that, uh, and, and I'm, I've never been one to actually read my, try to read my feelings and emotions and all that into the text, but as I've studied through this, uh, this amazing epistle, which has always been a favorite epistle of mine, from what I've gathered from this epistle, a lot of that, of what I just said, uh, f fits right into it. I could no more quit what I'm doing, I think, than I could quit a marriage. It's We're, we're sort of tied to the hip, so to speak. And I, I believe that we'll see that as we go into Philippians and we see these believers' relationships uh, with one another. Paul and his companions, and Lydia, uh, all the churches along the route of, of Paul's uh, missionary journey. His, we're looking at his second missionary journey here. There's a verse in verse 6, and we're not there yet. I haven't even begun in verse 1, but I want to just jump ahead real quick to verse 6, and I want to point out something that it should be so obvious to every Christian out there. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that or do you not? I can't think of another verse that is more straightforward and direct and to the point as it regards our, our, secure, our eternal security than, than that verse, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I've made several videos where that I put out my testimony, and in my testimony, I, I believe that I commented on the fact that when I first came to know the Lord, that was the big question on my mind was, was is once saved, always saved? Is it true or is it not? Tell me now, I gotta know. 
And I struggled with that. And it seems like every place that the Lord led me and showed me uh, these verses that, that absolutely made it clear, absolutely clear that that was, that that was true that I belong to Him and I belong to Him forever. That He would never leave me nor forsake me. I remember reading it, but I just, there was a time where I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, I know you say all this, but Lord, I know that's what the text says, but it just that just can't possibly be true. And then one day it dawned on me that this had to be true. And I, I was faced with the choice that I could either believe God that what he said was true or I could not. If we don't begin on the basis here in our study of Philippians, if we don't at least begin on the basis of who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ, how God sees us, if we don't understand how He sees us and how He relates to us, we're not going to get very far in this epistle. A lot of it is going to be left to chance, and we don't worship the God of chance. It's easy to say that, that, that Paul, you know, he made the decision to travel where he, he traveled in his in his missionary journeys. It's, it's easy to say that, well, Lydia could have, could have not been there for Paul to meet. She could have been, she could have been working, you know, dying, uh, dying purple garments, purple, you know, she was, uh, she worked in the, in the, in the dye trade. Uh, she was a prominent businesswoman. She didn't have to be there where Paul was. And it was just by accident. It was just by chance. And God took, saw that, and He took, He took the opportunity that, that chance allowed, for Him to to work in their lives according to His good will and pleasure. And, and folks, I can't do that. We're going to see in these first few verses the the mention of the of the gospel mentioned, the gospel. And right away in, in the minds of Christians, well, we know what the gospel is. The gospel is, you know, you need to accept Christ. You know, if you do something, God will do something. And that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is what Christ did. And that gospel contained within that gospel, that includes our position in Christ. It was as a result of the good news that we heard that we were called through God's Word and we heard the good news concerning uh, Christ's death in our place, that our being made one with Christ, a new creation in Christ. It was, it was, what, it was wrapped around the, the entire reality of the gospel was our position in Him, how we stood before God. Blameless, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And that is what finds us content through whatever circumstances God takes us. This, the theme of Philippians is going to be heavily centered upon our being content in whatever circumstances God designs, constructs for our lives. And if we don't understand that that's all of God, if, we, if somehow we slip down into that, fall off into that, that, that pit of, of wrong thinking that, that tries to convince us that somehow that, that we serve this God who's distant, it's it's kind of sort of like hands off. I'm not going to interfere with this with this person's life. They're gonna they are truly the, the captain of their own destiny, and and I'll just kind of go walk along behind them and I'll kind of clean up the mess that they leave behind. But I'm not going to walk in front of that 
that individual and I'm not going to lead them and I'm not going to guide them and I'm not going to direct them in, in the way in which I would like for them to go. There's a lot of comfort, great comfort, dearly beloved, in the fact that God works in us both the will and to do of His good pleasure. That He who has begun a, a good work in us will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. That He works all things according to the counsel of His own will. If I did not believe that, I, I just, I can't imagine how my life would be today. We're going to go through this epistle and we're going to look at not as much facts concerning the geographical location of Philippi and, and you know, you know, the population of Philippi and, you know, the, the founding of, you know, when Philippi first came into existence and, and you know, and uh, what all the population was made up of, you know, the different ethnic groups that it was made up. You know, all of that is wonderful. And if that's what you're interested in is, is in the history, a history lesson and all that, and that's fine. And I'll bring some of that into it. But my main focus here, folks, is on the theological aspects of this epistle. It, it always will be. It was with Romans. It was with Ephesians. It, it, it even was with Revelation. This church at Philippi was the first Christian church in Europe. It was planted by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey. Some, somewhere around A.D. 50. And the initial converts at Philippi were they say were Gentiles and the congregation developed into a predominantly Gentile fellowship uh, and women also played an essential role in the life of the church at Philippi it was located in ancient Greece on the eastern border of uh, Macedonia it was about 10 miles inland from the coast it was a very strategic area in ancient times. It sat on a, on a fertile plain, and there was a trade highway that passed through there. Many travelers passed through Philippi on their way to Rome. It was famous for its, uh, its gold mines, its springs of water. In fact, it was from those springs that the, the town received its name. And then it was renamed Philippi after Philip of Macedonia, the father of Alexander the Great. And by New Testament times, it, it, it had, the city had become, had come under Roman rule with uh, quite a diverse population. And uh, there was a famous school of medicine there. It, it might have been where the, uh, the gospel writer Luke may have studied. There's been a lot of archaeological research done around the area, and it, it, it did contain a, a temple uh, built somewhere around 400 B.C., a temple of Apollo and Artemis. Now, Paul was called by God in a vision to go to Macedonia. God directed him to go there. Paul didn't just suddenly decide one day, well, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go, you know, to Macedonia. Now, we, I could stop right there and I could do what I love to do, and that's just preach on the fact that God directs every step of our lives. But... I want to try to deal with the text. As we go through the text, we're going to see many of these truths come to, come to the surface. And it's important to me that we try to study through this epistle in a way that we don't miss seeing all of these little golden nuggets of truth along the way. Paul had a vision 
of a man of Macedonia standing and, and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so right after he, Paul received the vision, uh, he gets ready. Uh, he readies himself at once to leave, uh, knowing absolutely certain of the fact that God had called him to preach the gospel to them. We read about that in the 16th chapter of Acts. Paul explains how that occurred. And so he traveled. He travels to Philippi, and he's accompanied by Silas and Timothy and Luke. And uh, so there's a lot of background on Philippi that we could talk about. But I don't want to focus too heavily on the what I would consider non-essential facts, even though they're not. There's really no such thing as non-essential facts. I, I would just say more important facts. I would like to to focus on the more important aspects of of this meeting uh, that occurred between Paul, his companions, and these believers at Philippi. Now, Paul had this custom, and that was that uh, he was to go to the synagogue whenever he first arrived in a new place, a new, a new city. But in Philippi, there was no synagogue. Apparently, there was no synagogue. Uh, he went to the river where he knew that Jews would be worshiping. We see that in Acts. And there Paul meets Lydia. We don't know if Lydia was a Jew or a Gentile. The text really doesn't say. But it, it does make it clear that she became the first Christian convert in Europe. She was from Thyatira. Okay. Uh, she was a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. And we might stop and ask ourselves, how could she be a worshiper of God if she had never heard of Christ Jesus? We know that when we see from the text, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. <clears throat> My question to you is, are you going to take the, the conventional uh, sort of route here and believe that uh, Lydia was the master of her own destiny. <coughs> Excuse me. She just happened to be there. She just happened to be where she was. Uh, she had she had the opportunity. She had the choice, the free will. To, to either understand the gospel, reject the gospel, accept the gospel. I'm going to suggest to you, dearly beloved people out here, that Lydia couldn't do anything other than what she did. That God had her right where he wanted her. That Lydia belonged to, to him. That the timing was perfect. That she couldn't do anything other than believe the gospel that Paul delivered unto her. There's no possible way that she, as one of God's sheep, could reject that calling. And that's, I believe that is highly important to understand that because it's, it seems to be in the minds of most Christians today, the majority in fact, that that's just not how that this works. That somehow we are uh, masters of our own destiny. But she responded to Paul's message. She did because she was one of God's sheep. As a result of that, the rest of her household were baptized. She invited them to her home. She, she told Paul, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come stay at my house. And... Uh, they were persuaded uh, by uh, 
Paul and his companions were persuaded that she truly was a believer, and they accepted the invitation. There were several interesting things that happened during Paul's second missionary journey. The, uh, Lydia's conversion was the first of, of several events associated with the beginning of the church there. The second was the exorcism of demons from a slave girl, which we see resulted in Paul and Silas being thrown into prison. And then the third was the conversion of the Philippian jailer and his family. Again, uh, it's it's uh, there's there's some questions that arise, theological questions that arise as a result of that conversion of you know how in what way was the Philippian jailer converted? You know, was he was he already one of God's people just like Lydia? Uh, was it is it was it redemption that the the Philippian jailer was concerned about? Was it salvation, deliverance? Uh, those questions arise. I'm going to suggest there was absolutely no synergism involved. That it was not a question of redemption. The Philippian jailer was as much as much belonged to Christ as Lydia did, as much as you did, as much as I did. There is no possible way that you could have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior unless the Father had given you as a gift to, to Christ. Now that's that's what our Bibles say, but, but in most cases, Christians just don't want to accept that fact. They don't, they don't want to believe that. They have to believe that they are somehow masters of their own destiny. They're captains of their own ship. They decide where they're going to go, when they're going to do it, how they're going to do it. And, and God just sort of tags along behind us and, and, you know, maybe He cleans up the messes that we leave behind us in our path of destruction through life. Maybe He doesn't. But, it, but He's certainly not in the lead. We are, we are in the lead. We are, you know, we are... God gave us free will, and and by golly, I mean, He doesn't interfere with that. I'm going to suggest that, that you've been, if you believe that, then you've been sold a bill of goods. Oh, but Steve, that, we're talking about free will. How could God force us to do... How, my question to you would be, how much have you really studied this book? In every single instance, God called these individuals. I don't care if we're talking about Moses. I don't care if we're talking about Joseph, Lydia, Paul, you, me. God called us through His Word. We were His sheep. He knew us. He, he intimately, before we were ever born, There's something that's much deeper here about our, our relationship with the Lord, how it became about than what most Christians want to believe or accept. If we're typically, folks, and this is my personal belief, typically I think that most Christians today, they're just like any other people. They 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 you cut them, they bleed, they, they hurt, they get hurt, they cry. I mean, I got hurt. I mean, when I when that cable snapped and hit me, you know, I thought that, uh, well, I, for a minute there, I thought I was going to pass out. I mean, it hurt. Uh, don't let them tell you that cowboys don't cry, okay? Uh, I mean, they can cry like a two-year-old. It really hurt. Was that, that that one little incident in my life, was that designed, constructed, engineered, ordained, decreed, 
by a sovereign God who had his best in mind for me. It absolutely was. Now, I'm going to believe that because that's what, that's what my Bible says. If you don't want to believe that about your life, that's, well, that's your choice. You can't change the truth by whether you, you know, the, the truth of God is not, doesn't hang on. It's not dependent upon whether you believe it or not. Okay. And I, you know, I didn't want to get off on a, on a, on a, on a bunch of rabbit trails here. I haven't even really opened up the study yet. We haven't even looked at the first verse, but I'm trying to give you somewhat of an underlying a foundation, a footing, okay, if you will, you know, for, for, for you to stand upon as, as we open up this, this, this amazing epistle and we look at the comfort of God's grace in his sovereign will and direction over our lives. So many Christians today need to understand that because they're floundering in a sea of despair over something that they've done or something that someone else has done to them. If we can't find ourselves content in all circumstances, knowing that, that we, we have a loving, sovereign God who, who is supremely interested in nothing but our, our, our well-being, our best, who has nothing but our best in mind. If we don't believe that, if we don't trust him concerning that, then when we find ourselves in prison, like Paul, well, are we going to be singing praises unto God? From the time that this church was established there, the, the, the church at Philippi was healthy. It was strong. And it was generous. That The first church there in Philippi, it might have been Lydia's home for all we know. We don't really know for certain, but when we reach heaven, I believe that we're going to see, we're going to find this seller of purple Lydia wearing a garment not stained with dye but washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Do you realize that you, this very day, as a believer in Christ, you stand before God washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb? that God has nothing against you. That He knows the paths that you take. And, that, and, and when, when He has tested you, you will absolutely, you shall come forth as gold. We, we see, we're going to see in this epistle that God brings good results even out of a sharp disagreement. Okay, Barnabas and Paul, they split up, they go in different directions. I mean, I've actually seen that happen in my own life with the brethren. Meaning that the gospel was then shared in, in, in new places, okay? And yet we tend to look at something, oh my gosh, that's just, that's just horrible. You know, these two, these two brothers, they split up and they went their separate ways. Have we forgotten, folks, that the Lord works all things according to the counsel of His own will? Paul, Silas, Timothy. They listened to the Holy Spirit and they only went where He allowed And if they did not, and this is, this is an important point I think you need to consider, when we do not, when we find ourselves where we think that we are somehow outside God's will, which, and I don't really, I don't fully comprehend, I have a hard time comprehending such a statement as that. You know, when are we, the question in my mind is when are we ever 
When do we ever step outside God's determined will for our lives? What is true, folks? Settle it today. Settle it right now. What is true? What is true of you and God? Is, do you, is the God that you love, that you know, that you serve, is, is the sovereign God, the majesty of all, all, the one who hung the stars in the sky, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, the one who holds all things together by his power, is, is the God that you know a God who, who somehow has, has left this little loophole here. There's, there's a little loophole here in the truth here, and that is that you can, you can go apart from God's... There can come a time where that God is no longer, no longer working in you according to His good will and pleasure. Now, I, I have never been able to say that. I have never in my life, I can't remember ever truly believing that there, 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 there comes a time in my life where that God just completely, he just, it's hands off, okay? Well, the person's decided to go his own way, and I'm going to let him go his own way. And Now, that it may appear to be that way on the surface, but folks, I don't believe that for one second. For one fleeting moment do I... I don't believe that. What I believe is, and you don't have to agree with me, and in, in fact, I, I encourage you not to just believe something because I believe it, but I am telling you that in the, in my, in the, with everything that seems to make up every molecule of my new man, my new creation in Christ tells me that God has determined a course, a plan for my life. He's, he's working in me both the will and do of His good pleasure. He's going to carry out that plan. He's going to complete that plan from beginning to end. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He never takes a, a recess, okay? He never takes a time out. And... I want you to, you folks, dearly beloved, I want you to understand the comfort and the joy that is accompanied by that truth, that, that reality. And, and I want you to think about how, how, how can there be any true comfort, true joy of, of fellowship and the Spirit? How can there be that that, that, we're, that we're going to read about in the text here? How can there be that? How can we know that peace that, that passes understanding, that joy unspeakable? It, how can we know that if we, if we believe that somehow we can step outside of God's, we can just kind of get lost where he doesn't know where we're at. Well, or, or he knows where we're at, but we're just, but he's going to leave us alone. And he's, he's, you know, ultimately in the end, we are masters of our own destiny. We determine our fate, not God. Folks, we were bought with a price. He owns us. He can do whatever He wants to with us. Whatever He wants to, to do. And what we can take comfort in is, is the fact that whatever He does in our lives, whatever He allows in our lives, no matter what circumstance, what the circumstance, we can take peace, we can take comfort and have peace and we can rest in the fact that it is, it is truly is God at work in us, both the will and do of His good pleasure. That we're right where He wants us to be in any given moment, doing whatever He, whatever he would have us do. It, even that which we would, we tend to think that, well, that, that just certainly that can't be true. You, not this. I can see these things, but not this, not this other thing. It's, Surely he has nothing to do with that. Think it through, dearly beloved. That is not how that works. If there's ever one moment that God has his eye off of you, that he has his mind off away from you, that he's got his that that his somehow the the will of the creature has overridden the will of the of the creator, 
If, if that is true, then folks, we are in trouble. Okay? We're in trouble. Lydia had no idea. She never knew your name. We know hers. She never knew yours. She had no idea how the Lord was going to use her the way that she did. Lydia was the first European convert. Okay? We are the fruit of her labor. We're actually the fruit of God's labor through her, but to be more specific. But, but we are the fruit of her labor. God had her there to meet Paul and his companion his company of, of believers, she heard the gospel of Christ because she was God's child. The text does not show the importance of Paul knowing his audience when sharing the gospel. Oh, we've got to know our audience. No, we need to know the gospel. God's got the audience covered. And then you got, we see Paul and Silas where they continue to praise God even from their jail cell in Philippi after, a, after getting seriously beat, almost probably half to death. And we know that God honors that sacrifice of praise. You may not be in a prison cell and you may not be uh, currently being uh, beaten, flogged, abused, compared to the trials that we go through in life, we may not, and we, we always categorize these, these trials and these troubles and these difficulties as, you know, well, this is worse than that, and, and this is really bad, and, well, this is not so bad, and, and everything. And then God frees them. He, God, he frees them with a supernatural earthquake I'm going, to, I'm going to suggest that the gospel isn't hindered by something as bothersome as freedom, personal freedom. I, I can remember believers when I, when I first came to know the Lord, I, I saw a handful of believers that they would, they would stand out in the parking lot next to their cars after church. It was like midnight, and they couldn't break up their little soiree that they had going, their little group, their fellowship you know, they were just fellowshipping over the truth of God's grace and the love and the mercy of God and the wonders of, of God's grace. And they just couldn't leave one another and get in their cars and drive home. It's after midnight. What, what compelled them to, what compels people to do that? And then and as, as compared to just jumping in your car right away after the church service and, and, and running back home, they didn't want to leave. I can, I can easily understand an earthquake. God sending an earthquake and they're free to leave, but none of them do. Do you understand how powerful the gospel is, folks? If you followed this channel for any length of time, you, you, you surely you at, at least have gotten a glimpse of, of how powerful the gospel of Christ truly is. Because the gospel is not we got to do something to be for God to do something. The, the gospel is what Christ did. It grips you, it grips you, it, it hugs you, it, 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 it grabs a hold of your life and it controls your life. It directs your life in such a way. The gospel itself directs your life in such a way as to where that you can take comfort in the fact that you are right where God wants you at any given moment. He's got only your best in mind. You, you shall, you'll be tested, but you will come forth as gold. And that God would have you trust Him. How many of you out there is, have seen how compassionate God is to, to give encouragement to you at just the right time? It just, it just comes along right at the right time. You know, I've, I, heard, I heard my whole life that, 
the you know the, the especially when I was going through the military you know I'd hear that the opposite of fear you know is courage just you know got to have courage then we won't have fear you know folks the opposite of fear isn't courage it's love okay perfect love casts out all fear Paul and his companions, they loved one another. Paul and those that, he, that they ministered to, they loved one another. And, and Philippians is all about learning contentment in hardships, suffering, trials, difficulties. You know, it's you wake up one morning and you, and you, think, you, you think it's just going to be another day and then something happens that's out of your control and then suddenly you get thrown out of your comfort zone where you become overwhelmed with toxic, feelings of fear, uncertainty, helplessness. Many of you could probably relate to that if, if you're living in some of the, these trouble, these inner cities here in America today where that there's a lot of trouble going on. And helplessness. You know, your mind, it, automatically it races to this that awful question, what if, what if, what if, what if? Something goes wrong with your job, your family, your your you know your spouse, your your kids, your relationships, your reputation, your 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 finances. Something goes wrong, and it's and it's oh what if? It's 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 sort of human nature to ask that question. You know, it's uh, automatic tendency is to just say you know what if what if this you know? How about viewing it as what it is? It's a circumstance that's designed by loving, sovereign God that's hugging you to trust Him. He's not beating you over the brow to trust Him. He's hugging you to trust Him. Life, folks, is simply far too complex, especially nowadays. It is far, far too complex not to trust Him through all the uncertainties of life because that's just pretty much what life is. It's just a, a long series of uncertainties. And you're going to trust in yourself. Verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, bond slaves to all the saints in, in Jesus Christ which were at Philippi. Well, the word the is not there in the original text. Saints with bishops and deacons is what it's saying. It's, it's an, an organized assembly. <coughs> He's not setting uh, uh, the, uh, the saints uh, apart from the bishops and the deacons. Well, I'm writing to the saints, but I'm also writing to the church. It's, it's literally just simply says saints with bishops and deacons. That's, that's what it's saying. Grace. Grace be unto you. Grace. And peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the deity of Christ clearly as clear as day there. But grace and peace. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Folks, grace and peace. Grace and peace. Okay? Grace. Today. Today. This day. For you. In your life. Today. Grace and peace. And same, the same for tomorrow. Is it grace and peace for today, but well, it may not be grace and peace tomorrow. You know, we, we become so accustomed to looking at these words in the text that grace and peace, grace and peace. We, we, we just brush over it so lightly, folks. We don't let our, our teeth sink into the, the, the marvelous words in the, uh, in the text here that we don't give them their due. Grace and peace. 
I, I think personally, I think most Christians today have the wrong understanding, entirely wrong understanding of what grace is. Grace is just something that God brings in alongside. You know, if you fail, if you slip up, if you mess up, then God gives you grace. And he's going to kind of help you along. And, you know, it's kind of like his, he's just, you know, doing you a favor, you know, from time to time. You know, grace isn't constant, unending, un unswerving. No, it just, it's something that God, it's a tool in God's toolbox. And he kind of uses you know, all I got to pull out grace because, you know, he's messing up over here. Grace and peace. The, the idea that I can sit here today knowing full well that, that God, God's grace and God's peace governs my life. I, what words can any of us folks possibly you know, throw out the, the, the how, how can you describe that where's the peace and the comfort of, of not believing that you live in the that you sail upon a sea of God's love mercy and grace and peace and then it gets more interesting in verse 3 I thank my God, Paul says, upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all. You don't see Paul, his, you don't see a focus on self here. It's not, he's not talking about He's, it's not prayers concerning himself. It's prayers concerning them. I think, and I'm going to suggest that, that we live in an age in, in which most Christians today, when they think of prayer, that automatically it's, you know, it's at least first and foremost, it's, you know, me first. Me first. I got, you know, I'm praying for me. Lord, this is what I need. I need this, and I need this, and I want this, and I, I hope you do this in my life, and it's just, it's me. It's me. It's all about me. Me, 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 me. And right away, we don't, we, we see that Paul's concern is for them. And I, I don't want that to escape your notice. He's thanking God for every remembrance of them. Always, in every prayer making a request with joy, with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Oh, Paul is so happy. He's, he's overjoyed of, of... Yeah, he's overjoyed with uh, the fact that they're fellowshipping in the gospel from the first day until now, uh, at least uh, the ones that are. And, and, and some of them aren't. Some of them can't be. But some of them are, and so that's what he's talking about. That's that's not what I'm seeing in the text at all. If what I'm reading into that, out of that text, I don't think I'm reading anything into it, is the fact that if we belong to God, our fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now is is a continuation of of that which it, we it can't be anything else. I want you to try to imagine just for a moment, folks, you, you just all of a sudden you just stop believing in the gospel. Being confident, confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work, singular, it's a good work, not good works, not not he that hath, which hath begun good works in you. It's a good work singular in you. We'll, we'll perform, we'll complete it, is the word, until the day of Jesus Christ. That is, until he returns. No wonder God will complete the work he began in us because that work is centered in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Nothing else could ever be made complete. But the gospel is.
verse 7, even, even as it is meet, it's, it's, it's correct. Is the, the Greek word there, you, can, you, could, you could rightly translate that correct. Even as it is correct for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all are partakers of my grace. The word defense is, means a well-reasoned reply. It's a, it's a thought-out response to uh, where that you, you, your desire is to, is to adequately address the issue that's raised. And the word confirmation is, is from a word that literally means, you know, what can be tread upon, what is fully dependable. Think of it like a concrete sidewalk. You, you really, your feet really trust that concrete sidewalk. What is fully dependable, worthy of confidence because it's on solid footing. That's what the word means. It describes what is fully stable, that, that which can be trusted to give full support. I, I believe, folks, as we go through this this amazing epistle, that what we're going to see is we're going to we're looking at God making real in our experience that which which is already true of us in Christ that we may not have experienced, you know, in, in real time, in real life. Many Christians, folks, walk through this life unaware of, ignorant of. that which would bring them comfort, peace, joy. It's not our gaining some lofty position in Christ by, by meeting some vain imaginary uh, qualification or obligation. Not, not that God would label our lives as a, as a success, providing we somehow, somehow we just meet certain obligations. We desire, we pray that others live up to who they now truly are in Christ. It, it's my desire that, it, it is not my desire that you or I add anything to the perfect finished work of Christ. It is my desire that we all, all of us, understand the import, the impact of Christ's finished work on our behalf, of what that truly means, that he's applied the finished work of Christ on our behalf. So we're looking at, at Paul's heart for the believers at Philippi. That was, that they were his joy. He includes them, okay? Their faith in what he believed was his defense and confirmation of the gospel. So how are we gonna live given given that fact? Given this revelation, how are we to live? How are we to respond and relate to one another? Is it my job to redirect you off into some area that God is not working in your life? Christians do that all the time. That's, that's law. It's not grace. I wish I could have done a better job with the intro here of this. Uh, I've had a, a a little bit of a time uh, preparing for this, but now that we're into it, I hope that you'll you'll stay with us and you'll go through this this wonderful epistle with us. Like I said, it's it's Philippians is one of my very favorite books of the Bible. I you know I shouldn't I guess I probably shouldn't choose any any particular. Uh, book or verse as, as being elevated above all the rest as being something special. Perhaps I shouldn't do that. At least personally in my own life, it's been it's a great it's been a great comforting epistle, and I and I hope that you will uh, see much of what I've seen in it as we go through it. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Uh, thank you for allowing me the time to. Uh, to just sort of rest up a little bit before going from Revelation to this. I want to thank all of you out, out there who, who 
have shown concern for me. Uh, I, I went four years straight without really taking any time off. And it was suggested after Revelation that I do, and I did. And I got caught up on some, some work around the place. And uh, uh, um, I should heal up nicely. It uh, uh, doesn't look nearly as bad now as it did whenever I first did it. But I couldn't put you folks off any longer. I couldn't wait to get back because I missed you all. I love you and I miss you. Rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.